Welcome to Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. This show is dedicated to asking tough questions for you, the viewers. We bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Today, we're going to be talking about law enforcement. Law enforcement is a career that is always in the public eye, whether it's for heroic reasons or scandals. It's a profession that more than 900,000 Americans hold knowing full well the hazards associated with their occupation. In the past 10 years, for instance, more than 1,500 police officers, including 158 in 2018 alone, died in the line of duty. Tens of thousands more were assaulted and injured. There isn't a cop in the country who doesn't understand that dishonesty or improper use of force or discrimination damps all police officers. Some of the negativity publicity is deserved. There are officers who are clearly wrong as to their use of force. The records reveal tens of thousands of cases of serious misconduct and abuse. They include over 22,000 investigations of officers using excessive force, 3,200 allegations of rape, child molestation, and other sexual misconduct, and 3,000 cases of domestic violence by officers. There is no excuse for abuse of power. There is no excuse for egregious force. There is no excuse for sexual misconduct. Cops are held to a higher standard. There are, there are 800,000 sworn law officers employed by the state and local agencies and another 325,000 non-sworn officers in federal, state, county, and local agencies. These statistics come from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. There is no workforce over a million people without problems. Less than 10% of officers in most police forces get investigated for misconduct. I'm unaware of any profession that can claim that over 90% of their employees are misconduct free. How many priests, ministers, and other clergy members have been implicated in sexual or emotional misconduct? How many executives have been charged with less than honest business dealings? Officers have beaten members of the public, planted evidence, and used their badges to harass women. They have lied, stolen, dealt drugs, driven drunk, and abused their spouses. Despite their role as public servants, the men and women who swear an oath to keep communities safe can generally avoid public scrutiny for their misdeeds. The records of their misconducts are filed away, rarely seen by anyone outside their department. Police unions and, their pol and politicians align have worked to put special protections in place to ensure some records are shielded from the public's view or even destroyed. Most misconducts involve routine infractions, but the records reveal tens of thousands of cases of serious misconduct and abuse. They include 23,000 investigations of officers using excessive force, 3,200 allegations of rape, child molestation, and sexual misconduct and over 3,000 cases of domestic, domestic violence by officers. Dishonesty is a frequent problem. The records document at least 3,000 instances of perjury, tampering with evidence or witnesses, or falsifying reports. There were 418 reports of officers obstructing investigations, most often when they or someone they knew were targets. Less than 10% of officers in most police force get investigated for misconduct. Yet, some officers are constantly under investigation. Nearly 3,000 have been investigated on 10 or more charges. 20 face 100 or more allegations, yet kept their badge for years. Today, we will explore why these things may be happening. Joining us here today at our Hebrew studio owner of Your Boy Nice, Mr. Andy Pena, and also join us by phone, founder of New England Truth, is no other than Tyrone. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for being here. 
First, we're going to start with you, Mr. Hola. Pena. Thank you, um, Tyrone. Um, Mr. Pena, yes, sir. please tell us a little bit about yourself. So like you said, my name is Andy Pena, local business owner here at YBN, your boy Nice, local taxpayer, pleasure to be here in the People's Network, AC Media. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming by. Uh, Mr. Pena, what measures uh, should police undertake to improve relationships with the community? More community organization. They should like offer maybe police cookouts in local on purpose neighborhoods. You know, bring it to them. Bring it to the their basketball courts, their local parks. And set up maybe you know a little fun day, a little face painting event or something like that. So I'm yeah. aware that the uh, most police departments do have those type of events, uh, usually held like in the police station or the downtown areas. Uh, can you expand a little bit in reference to community-wise? Well, you said it all in the introduction. Um, most people are afraid to communicate with dog police officers. You know even though they're just on a job like anybody else, but there are some that are not as nice or friendly as others. And that scares the people, and some people in their own community are frowned upon for even talking for, to police officers. But if you bring it into their backyard, maybe there's a, there's a comfort level. There's a more of a community there. Great, and I tend to agree with that. I wanna bring in Tyrone. Tyrone, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Tyrone, welcome yes. to Behind the Scenes, sir. Thank you very much. Please tell Hi, us. Pena. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am a 52-year-old uh, white male that grew up in the streets in New York. I uh, did, uh, did some crimes, did some foul things in my in my childhood. Strained my life around. Uh, became somewhat uh, of an executive, I guess you would say. And I was violated by a police officer while in the course of my duties. Uh, I went took that police officer and a subsequent arrest the whole department to court and one as my own pro se litigant. And I plan on filing a federal lawsuit as well. So Tyrone, let me ask you this. What are, what are the biggest issues facing police officers today? Well, the biggest issues is the basics. Uh, when you were talking about, you know, playing basketball, I love basketball. I mean, I love basketball. Uh, just so I don't set though. But I went and I, uh, worked with, volunteered with the police department after I got out of jail. And we were going around to schools, to high schools, and to boys clubs, and to Teachers Association of America. And I'm going to tell you something. The reason why people don't want to talk to police is because that whole thing is just for a dog and pony show. Unfortunately, that's substance. If you think for a minute a police officer isn't going to put or try to get somebody in that group to work with them as a CO or CI, I mean, you know, that's not crazy. So the problem with that is you've got 20, 30% great cops and then you've got 60, 70% bad cops. Uh, it's an arbitrary number, I'm making it up. Well, how are you supposed to feel good about playing basketball and let down your guard against somebody that you know those are the numbers? So let me ask you this, uh, Tyrone. Uh, do you think the police departments should be investing more on technology? Uh, equipment or focus more on developing uh, soft skills to uh, to be used in in communities in community I, policing. I 100% believe that the police departments are way way ahead of where they need to be I think that there's a lot of waste uh, they get military surplus funds every year and it's increasing every year uh, and they get grants and then they get obviously their, our tax dollars yeah, I mean, look at them. Look at those beautiful cars. Look how many sit in the parking lot. Let's take some of that money, all right? Let's focus on some training, human resource training for these people. So how to not get so upset when you're dealing with a public that is upset. Your job is, is, is a tough job, right? Why do you think... So if you know... Oh, why, why do you think that the public is so upset with law enforcement? Well, today? that's because of technology. That harkens back to technology. All right, we've got technology now, and people that were dumb are now going, oh, wait a second. And then people are able to voice this also. I never thought I'd be a YouTuber. Come on. And now I have a platform of 10,000 people that I can say to them, this is what's going on. Look, open your eyes, you know. 
So I think that the problem, you know, the problem is systemic from the beginning, the Pinkerton days, and it really has never got, gone away. And now with the Patriot Act, it's like full force. And that's why I got involved too. Yeah, the Patriot uh, Act did uh, change everything. Um, mm. That that really did change. Uh, Mr. Pena, what was your take on uh, what Mr. Tyrone just said? No, he's, he's definitely right. I, I agree. Have you been hearing that from people that come into your uh, local business and uh, people that you Well, he know? said that, you know, that's why the, the, the community is frowned upon when you talk against a cop. Because for what he said, they try to turn you into a confidential informant, a CI. And that's how you looked on, even if you say hi to a police officer passing by. Because so, they're, they're so frivolous. They try, they're trying to entrap people. It's not just on the job. They're trying to make a name for them, a rank. So Ty Tyrone, I, I know that you have uh, tons of videos out there and uh, we'll, we'll give out your uh, YouTube channel uh, later on in the program. Uh, but what made you get into uh, recording um, public photography, uh, especially uh, for government officials and law enforcement? Uh, I got it because of, I, w I was assaulted at work. That, like I said earlier, and the hypocrisy there, and I had been aware of it. I, saw, I heard about cop locking and cop watching, and I said, oh, what's this? Finally, someone else is doing what I've been doing for the last 20, 30 years. You know, I've always done that. I just never video recorded it. And now everybody's doing it, it's like, cool. Everybody's starting to stand up. And so I said, well, if I can do that and offer a service to the community, I'm gonna do it because I was victimized. So they created me. I am a creation of the hypocrisy. I am not the cause of it. So when you say bad cops, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, what you mean by a bad cop? Because uh, if you ask uh, generally out in, in, in public, a lot of people would say that not all cops are bad cops. What would you consider a bad cop? Tyrone? I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi. I'm sorry, I lost you. Yeah, let me, uh, so what would, you who would, what would you consider a bad cop? A bad cop is a cop that carries his emotions into work and doesn't try to get better. We all have a learning curve. We all learn at our job. And, and, and no matter what job you got, you gotta learn. And the people that are training these people are training them that we're the enemy, they're different. All right, you've got a training uh, issue that right from the beginning, creating bad cops by inception. So they come out here, they see things wrong, they don't stand up, that makes them a bad cop. I'd rather have a cop be a jerk to my face than be one of those passive aggressive manipulative people because at least he's being honest about being that way you know i'm not saying it's right you know you've got cops that don't tell another cops come on we know i think these guys are creating or, or committing civil rights violations by protocol so you say it's more lack of training so should training be improved I, I would say not lack of, they're training the wrong way. They train a lot. I mean, I mean, I don't know if they train a lot. I think they need more legal advice, but I think they train. It's just that they don't train them to be connected with the community. They literally train them that we are the enemy. Is that, is that your take? I mean, how does that make you feel? Is that your take as well, Mr. Pena? Yeah, I think it's excessive training. I think they have way too much training and training in the wrong areas. So they're trained to go out there and find, not wait to serve. Mm. So what makes a good employee, mm. if, that, if that was your question, what makes a good employee, if I'm a line cook at a, at a restaurant, I wait for the order and execute the order. I'm not in the front busting tables. You ready, you need it, you got it, you want it? That's, that's, that's not, that's, re, that's reverse policing, right? They, they're trying to be there before the, the crime happens. Correct. And, and they turn the public against them while doing it. And it's not like we see fire, fire departments going out looking for Correct. fire. But we Correct. do see law enforcement out there looking for crime. But some people would say that that's a good thing. Some people would say that that is preventing police, you know, being proactive, trying to prevent things from happening. What say you on that, Tarot? Well, there's a double-edged sword there. Yes, that's perfect. That's great. Yes. We want that. We want people, we want police officers to do their job. 
not extort money from us for tra- tra- traffic violations, but the problem with that is they get out there, they're encouraged to get these uh, write-ups, these summons, these whatever tickets, and if they fall short, guess what's going to happen? They're going to now create an incident without even realizing, subconsciously or whatever, all right? They get a little pissed off, even a little pushed back because the videos now, we start to become educated. We're going to say to the police officer, well, why did you pull me over? And guess what's going to happen? That police officer is going to want to rip you out of that car sometimes. Not all the time, but a lot of times. That's the problem. Too many times. And I don't think that that double-edged sword is going to be clarified until things are dealt with in a training sense. So basically, they will attempt to violate your civil rights or basically accuse you of interfering with their, uh, with their duties or um, yeah. being disorderly. Disorderly, yeah. Those type of lines. Breach, breach of peace, you know, all that stuff. It's, and those are the most frivolous charges that they can throw at you. And when I go to court, uh, and I have, like I said, and I don't lie, I have won every case. And I got another one coming up. And I'm going to win it. I know I'm going to win it. Uh, and it's just a bullshit harassing the second degree because I bumped somebody or he bumped me. You know, they just want to get something. They want to push back. It's like a game to them. And the law should be a game. People's civil rights should not be a game. It shouldn't be for you to get a promotion. And officers do take an oath to uh, protect and to serve, but as recent rulings from the Supreme Court, they have ruled that police officers don't have legal obligation to to protect anyone. So they're basically here no, they to serve not. the citizens. No, they do not. No obligation whatsoever. Supreme Court has ruled on that a number of times, actually. So, and the photography has changed recently, but that's the only thing I'm concerned about. Correct. And public photography, it's, it's a constitutional right under the First Amendment. It's a, it's a guaranteed right that should not be um, infringed upon. Is that correct? I think that is the only guaranteed form of employment in the United States of America. You can be a journalist or a photographer at any time you want. So what strategies do you believe have been proven effective uh, in defying the police force so that there is more representations of, uh, for the community? Is that for me or can you? Uh, you can answer that. Uh, I would say that uh, it's got to start at the top and it's about accountability so if you're not going to get that top dog that uh captain or you know whoever's running that department um yeah, it's not going to change because it's a cultural systemic thing and it's too easy to change the whole body with a, with with a leadership when it's that tight of a hierarchical system it's a police department but they're militaristic so they're going to all give each other this salute yes sergeant yes sergeant so if that captain says go out there and do this they're going to do it man so I, I say it's got to be a civilian oversight board that's not elected by the police department or any politician that's elected by the people, for the people. So a civilian accountability board, that sounds uh, like a, a thing that should be placed, put in place in every, every, every city? Uh, yes, but they tried it in New Jersey and one other location and it failed because you can't have the police department electing those people. How stupid. Or a politician. How stupid. And I would almost say it should be like a rotating chair scenario. So it's never uh, like, you know, we need term limits in Senate you know, or in Congress, you know, that kind of stuff. Correct. So it's, it, it's important to note that uh, this show has invited the, um, the police department to come in and, and talk about these particular uh, issues with us. Uh, and we had got no return response uh, from the police chief here in uh, Haverhill. Uh, and that, that says a lot uh, for this particular chief on accountability-wise, um, where the disconnect, where he does not want to meet with the constituents to discuss these particular issues. What say you on that? Me, again? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say I went to Inside Edition. Inside Edition told me before I got down there, look, we're not playing around. We're going to ask you some tough questions. And I said to them, if you're not going to ask you the tough questions, you wouldn't be legitimate. You wouldn't be doing your job. And if, you, if you're a police officer and your responsibility is to police the community and serve the community, then why 
why would you open up and give every opportunity, even if they are tough questions by adversaries, why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you be able to own up to that and have the confidence? So let me ask you this. Um, we ha I have some, some data that proves that um, traffic tickets, uh, police departments are generating extra revenue on, uh, on tickets. Mm. What's your take now, on... As you know, Massachusetts shut down a number of police departments, the state troopers barracks, because of all the fraudulent ghost tickets, overtime ripoffs, all the scams they were doing on this whole department and multiple departments, they closed them down. And that's happening all over the United States of America, slowly but surely with the modern age. But it's only the beginning. The problem is this has been going on so long, it's systemic. These people have created their existence this way. How are we gonna take this away from them? You're like saying to them, you're taking me away, my, all, everything away. But that is why it's so difficult here. That's why I, I almost feel like it's gonna have to come to a head at some point. I'm just praying that it doesn't. And you, you are correct. I mean, we have uh, requested from uh, multiple police departments here in the Merrimack Valley um, for their uh, policy on uh, quota. And they have come back and responded that their department does not operate under a quota. But yet, you mentioned the state police, and uh, they were proven to be wrong. They have been well, operating under a quota. There's police officers that have come back online and videotaped their sergeant or their whatever commanding officer giving a whole speech about you need to get tickets and the one guy had to go back after he was off duty to write more tickets to meet that quota. There's too many police officers on YouTube talking about it. Yeah. There's quotas, people. Stop lying to yourself. There's quotas. You know, informal or formal, there's quotas. They gotta justify their existence. Should all police departments be having uh, body cams for their officers, Mr. Pena? All police officers should have body cams on at all times if they're interacting with a civilian. If they are not, then they don't have to put it on. But if any time they're interacting with a civilian, turn it on. This whole thing of turning it on, turning it off, three second delay, five, whatever. Stop playing games, put them on, turn them on, and let's see what happens. I, I think if they have them, they definitely, they should use them. I'm kind of against the ta on the taxpayer side end. I don't want them to have that. Mm. I don't want them to have, mm. you know, I'm not saying that if they need it or not, but bulletproof vest, that's intimidating. I mean, in, in Massachusetts, mm. what's, the what's the concealed carry, you know? You, you, if you have a, a, a gun permit, you can't show it. So why are the police walking around with batons and guns and bulletproof vests looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his young days? And tasers, mm. you know? pepper spray. But only in, in these impoverished areas. You don't see them policing. They are way too militaristic, right? And they get all that surplus from our government. This right, is a like government extension. That. This is kind of like, you know, I try to tell people all the time, we got to wake up, man, because it's real. This is a made-for-profit scenario, and we are the customers. And it's exploitation. Right. And, uh, Tyrone, now, you, you, uh, you founded um, New England Truth. And you post Correct. all your videos with your encounters on police departments all across the states, uh, New York, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts. You were recently up in Lowell. Um, sure. what, Vermont, yep. What is the experience from police department, from police department? Are there different, uh, different policies, or uh, do you see them uh, all as operating the same? You know, that's a great question because I think, you know, you might think geographically there might be a difference. You might think, okay, well, if it's inner city or if it's in the country, or is it different? I'm going to tell you something. There's no rhyme or reason here. I have never seen a rhyme or reason because I can go in the country and meet the sweetest cop, greatest cop. You know, I can go into the city oh, yeah, and meet the same guy, nice guy. There's no rhyme or reason. All I know is that at the end of the day, Every police department in the United States of America has to look at how many of their cops are not doing the job right and start getting them to do it them right. It's about accountability. I've managed people all my life, thousands and thousands of employees, and I think Pena said that he owns a business. He knows what you know what it's like when you've got to manage somebody to do something 
that it's falling short, okay? At some point in time, you gotta let that person go because it's killing your bottom line, it's hurting you. You know, so, dragging your productivity down. When you talk about accountability, uh, there, what do you mean by accountability? Accountability, in other words, stop. It's a whole internal affairs thing, it's a joke. I filed complaints uh, before with internal affairs departments over the decades and nothing ever happens in here the same, same thing. Uh, you know, we don't have the resources we need to now go back and hold these people accountable. Nobody's holding them accountable. What are we gonna do? Sit here and stew? Sit here and get angry? Or are we gonna react? And now we're pushing back. We've got a couple uh, case, case uh, precedents that went in our way. And now they're starting to push back with the lobbyists and a change in the Supreme Court against the uh, transparency. And I'm concerned about that. So transparency and accountability go hand in hand, fire these guys, get rid of them, train them right, and start bringing professionals in, hold people accountable. Correct, and that's what this show basically uh, attempts to do. It's a, a show that promotes accountability and transparency within government, whether it's local law enforcement, whether it's uh, local politicians that are looking to uh, make a name for themselves, or whether it's uh, elected officials that have been serving for over 30 years. Um, so you bring a lot of good uh, points uh, to the show. You bring a lot of good points to uh, the issue that most people are facing today. Um, Tyrone, I appreciate you calling in today. Uh, where can people find your, sh uh, your program and take a look at some of your videos? Well, you can, you can go on, uh, obviously you can Google New England Truths and there will be, you know, either it's on Twitter or on YouTube on Facebook, there's a bunch of different locations where you can pick it up. I prefer you go to YouTube. Uh, that's up to you, whatever's convenient for you. Um, uh, but it's out there, New England Truth at YouTube is the home domain, and then there's a couple of the satellite uh, sites that you can go to. Great, and Mr. Pena. Well, you can catch me down at uh, YBN Custom Clothing, right here on Four Railroad right, uh, Square, right here in Haverhill. Appreciate it. And I just want to let the viewers know that this show is not anti-police. We don't have we don't have issues with all the police, but we do have an issue with the lack of accountability and the lack of transparency that is needed uh, to have a better community and be able to work with our law enforcement and our local poli politicians and our representatives over at uh, Beacon Hill, whether it's uh, in the state level or in Congress and the federal level. And we don't really see that. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in to Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. Join us next time as we go behind the scenes to ask the tough questions, bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Thank you for watching.